بسم الله الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه الغر الميامين أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته Welcome brothers and sisters to our second day of the winter annual conference Castles of Faith and now we will start with our first speaker Brother Zubair Brother Zubair, also known as Coach Zubair, is a strategist, breakthrough coach and trainer. He is blessed to have benefited from a very diverse range of experiences and has coached a wide range of people facing different challenges and helped them unleash their true capabilities. He is a married relationship coach at Abu Huraira Center, leads the Dawah and Convert Care team at Abu Huraira and conducts the Dawah and Convert coaching workshops and leads coaching teams with various other organizations such as IERA and UU. He is also the host and producer of weekly breakthrough podcast with Muslim Mastery. Brother Zubair is also a well-known cybersecurity researcher and has presented his research at several international conferences. He also runs social welfare organization Rahma Trust in Canada. Inshallah, today he will talk to us and he will share with us lessons learned and his models and ideas on how masajids, organizations, and community can best take care of converts and renewed Muslim. Bismillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in his book, ادعوا إلى سبيل ربك بالحكمة والموعظة الحسنة وجادلهم بالتي هي أحسن إن ربك هو أعلم بمن ضل عن سبيله وهو أعلم بالمهتدين which can be translated as to call to the way of Allah with wisdom and good admonition and argue with them in the best manner your Lord knows best who is guided and who is misguided. So as you all know that the theme of the conference is looking at and sharing ideas about the root causes of doubts of people running away from the religion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and how different people, different community members, educators, Islamic organizations, families can contribute to play a better role at this. Uh, what you see on the screen is, an, is, a, is a janitor, an astronaut, and a rocket. How this all relates, we'll come back to that in a second, inshallah. Uh, the theme, the format will be that we will be focusing on people who are new Muslims, converts, renewed Muslims, uh, people who were born in a Muslim family, but lost or were not practicing or only practicing culturally and at some point in their life they realized that they have to pursue the greater meaning of life and they have to pursue the love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have to build their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they start coming to the masjid or they start showing interest in Islam via different means. What can the communities do for them or what can the community should not do for them? We'll walk a story will we'll show a story of a reward sister. It's a real story. Uh, we'll pause it at different instances in her life and we'll use that to build a story and we'll use that to share some of the other real case studies, uh, real stories, real scenarios that I have personally observed or some of the complaints that I've received working in that field. At the end, we will show a successful story uh, using some of the techniques and models that we have been working with. Uh, this will be with our brother Muhammad Zaki, who is already sitting here, but we'll show you a recorded version of our brother. So let's proceed. Um, so some, something to think about is, what do we think about converts? When somebody takes shahada, how do we actually view them? When somebody starts coming to the masjid, how do we start viewing them? So if you want to have an analogy of the world, do you think that these are people who have paid $20,000 to a university and they're ready to come in, they're gonna come in nine o'clock every day, you know, go at three o'clock at home, they'll be studying hard, doing assignments, pulling all-nighters, or 
do you view them as someone uh, who is interested in improving their physical health and energy and goes up and signs up with, as a free membership to a gym or somebody who is doing a test ride of a car how do you view them will have a big impact on how you treat them second thing is what challenges do converts have or people renewed Muslims have does that mean that shaitan has given up on them that you know what that's it it's a pure soul I'm gonna leave it aside will they not have the same temptations that you and I have will they not have the same issues that you and I have when they go away from the masjid will they not be dealing with the same issues same desires same temptations as everybody else and perhaps worse because depending on what background they are coming from so let's let's play the video a bit I would like for you to come on a journey with me. Sisters, I have an announcement. Sister wants to take the shahada. Ashhadu. Ashhadu. Allah. 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 The important thing is that you cover and. Let's go back to that picture I had up for astronaut and a janitor. So it's basically going back to 1960s when uh, John F. Kennedy was visiting NASA and he was doing a tour of that place and he paused and he saw a janitor carrying a broom. He's like, what are you doing here? Right, so he, and the janitor replied, which has become a pretty important thing in the workplace these days. And he said, sir, I'm helping put a man on the moon. So this is very important, right? I mean, what kind of role are we playing? What is our vision of our own life? Do we see that when we are walking in the masjid, when we are coming in the masjid, are we coming as customers or are we playing a part in first getting ourselves close to Allah and then secondly helping other people get close to Allah. So that's a very important thing and it applies to the regular people like you and I that come pray, read our Quran, attend a class and go home, the people who donate to the masjid and different organizations the people who volunteer in the masjid and the people who work in the masjid right because what I've noticed is that sometimes we have this attitude of being a customer right so we'd come in for Ramadan we would use the iftar we do a dinner and we'll leave the empty bottles behind we'll leave our containers behind and these things kind of show what kind of mentality are we walking in at the masjid it also affects the newcomers negatively and I'll come to that and thirdly, when we interact with people, as we will see in the video, our words have impact, right? So it is very important for us that if we are telling our own opinion, to, to, to let them know that, hey, you know what, this is my personal preference. It's an acceptable lifestyle in Islam. This is not the only lifestyle in Islam. And it does not mean that it is the preferred lifestyle in Islam. And we'll see that why that's important. So, how, how can we contribute to that greater cause? So whichever organization, masjid, MSA that you belong to, ask this question. That, does that organization have a department, a team, that is focused on outreach, focused on talking to people who are interested in Islam or have doubts about Islam, and focused to take care of rewards or converts or newcomers? Right? For example, what do you think should happen with the sister after? Right, so when you see somebody taking a shahada here at the mic, what should happen after that? Who is going to call them? Should people even call them? Or should people give them their contact card and a bunch of books as our brother Zaki was given and wait for them to come back? What do you think? Do you think this will happen? Is shaitan passive? He's active, right? When those people walk out, they are seeing different advertisements, they are seeing all these different challenges so it is obvious that we need to have a proactive team a team that will not wait for them to call but rather follow up that will transfer the ownership of building the relationship with Allah to them but also facilitate that proactively so that's the first thing 
Does your masjid or does your organization have a team? How can you help with that? Can you increase awareness around you to help them have a team? Okay? And the second thing that you can do and I can do is keep an eye on a newcomer. Keep an eye on somebody who's interested in Islam. Keep an eye on someone who's having doubts about Islam. And talk to them, get their contact information, connect them with the nearest team to you. And if you don't have a team, you know, try to influence the people around you to have a team. So a shahada is a start of the journey. It's not the end of the journey. So we have two different extremes to it. Right? One is, say, okay, welcome. We're all brothers and sisters now. Here's the card of the manager. Here's a big box of books. Or perhaps sometimes just card. If you need anything, give us a call. That is a non-acceptable approach. We would never do that with our businesses. Right? Do you do that with, when you are trying to apply for a job? Or if you run a business, would you do that? Okay, call me if you need. You'll be proactive in your marketing. You'll be proactive to help people. Right? So how can we do this with the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala while we have different orders from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of them being what I recited at the beginning of the talk. Is it wisdom to give them the card and then leave them alone? The other extreme is also, you know, if somebody is interested, trying to really make the deen religion very hard for them. So then now the question becomes that how can you do, how can you take care of the people if you are part of the team? We have a very intensive and comprehensive training for the convert coaching team. That's a different topic. I won't get into that. I will create awareness that there's a need for those teams who exist in every organization. But at the same time, how can we help as general Muslims who may not have time or energy to devote to that cause being part of the team? So we'll continue with the video. And as the video is play, being played, think about what will you say to a convert? What things are important? How would you interact with them? So let's continue the video, inshallah. Wear proper hijab, pray, and don't eat pork anymore. Everything else will come later. Mom, Dad, I've got something to tell you. become a Muslim. Oh, so you're a terrorist now? Not in our home. You better leave this evil religion or there's no coming back here. Get out and leave. Go and ask your Muslims to help you. So you, I hope you can start appreciating the need of a team. People who are experienced in those issues, right? So it's not that we have a whole bunch of different issues. Things are typically quite common if you're living at the same century or living in the same year, right? So you can benefit from other people's experiences and resources that they have created. This kind of shows that there is a need for the team. Uh, secondly, what is important for them? How, how do we cultivate them? How do we nourish them? A and the importance of that. How did the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam nourished people? So we have a few examples um, from them being the famous narration in which the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam tells Mu'adh radiallahu an, O Mu'adh, are you putting people in trial? Right? And that is the famous narration in which he had a long prayer. So the, the point being that if something is not important at that time, something is not obligatory by Islam, why are some of the people making things obligatory to people? And this includes, now from real examples, you know, really, uh, talking about hijab or niqab or proper hijab or oh, I can see a hairline and this and that or you know dress this way or learn this language or wear these clothing and kind of imposing it on them and this is something that happens in 2017 right I have real examples for that it still happens so that's that right how do you work on increasing their faith and that's something that again we, we don't want to be talking about here that's a whole bunch of different topic and it's a much longer workshop but, but the point is that when you are interacting with them, what I would recommend is you first trying to see what's the nearest, nearest da'wah slash convert coaching team to you is and connecting them with that team. So get their contact information. If you don't have anything, just send me an email. Right? Alhamdulillah, we, we have a big network. We have been trying to you know, find people around the globe and make connections. Right? So we work with people who are who's a convert in the U.S., never met him. 
was introduced by a brother in this masjid. And we were supporting him throughout his journey from US to Indonesia to Malaysia. And so on and so forth. So things can happen. At least take that action. Make that introduction. Right? And be, be careful about what you say. Look, another narration in which the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, uh, and that was the famous incident about the Sahabi who was wounded in his head and the, and the people around him told him that you have to take ghusl, right? And he died because of that fatwa. He died because of that demand from the people that you should be taking ghusl even if you are injured, right? And the Prophet of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was very upset and he was angry about with those people and he said, they killed him, may Allah curse them, is not the cure for ignorance to ask, right? So if you don't know, if you have a particular fatwa for your own situation, do not give it to somebody else. Be careful about what you're directing them. People sometimes tell them, oh, this job is not halal, quit the job, Allah will provide you. You don't know what level of faith that person is in. And sometimes people do that, they quit the job, and then they don't have money, they, don't, they can't pay the rent, and then the community is sometimes not there to help them or support them. So be very careful about the fatwas that you issue to the converts. So make sure that you ask or get them connected to the sheikh or a scholar who understands their situation and can get, give them something that they can build on. So here's the best option, the safest option, but here are some risks with that. So if you can't bear that, continue with this, keep looking for a different job. I'm not giving a fatwa right now here, but I'm just saying that different things could be applied to different people. And we know from the example, uh, in which the, uh, the Messenger of Allah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam gave different instructions to two different companions about kissing wife while, while fasting. Right? So things differ uh, compare, uh, when comparing situation with situation. Uh, so this is something that's very important uh, to remember. Another thing that happened is that people start expressing their own political opinions, their opinions about non-Muslims, right? And this has nothing to do with Islam. It is based on their own culture. It is based on their experiences with different cultures. They don't realize that this is something a complaint received from converts. They don't realize that the people that they're talking about is the father or mother of that convert, is the aunt or uncle of that convert, right? And they see that all this generalization that, that are happening and they have to face that, right? Sometimes people have their own opinion about science and Islam. Oh, don't worry about science, just have tawakkul on Allah. Like who said that Islam denies science or does not encourage science? That, that could be your own opinion and your own level of knowledge, but when you're presenting that to converts or reverse or renewed Muslims as this is something from Islam, this gives them a very wrong impression, right? Oh, we don't have to work, you can take welfare. Right? You may have a situation in which case you would be doing that. But now you're telling this based in a masjid, dealing with converts and renewed Muslims. Oh, you don't have to go to universities and colleges. We shouldn't do that, right? You start using the word should. And you will see that in the video right now, that how people start using the word should. It's not a suggestion anymore. You're not saying, hey, consider doing that. Let's explore this idea. You're saying you should do this. And they repeatedly say, keep saying that. Another very important thing is around women's rights. So you may have a particular opinion about women's rights. Oh, I'm a stay-at-home mother. You should do that too. You don't have to study. Not realizing her background, not realizing where she's coming from, her situation, and trying to tell them this is Islam. Another very important thing is around medicine, right? So somebody may have some sort of a medical need especially when it comes to mental illness or depression and they're being told to go away from medicines, right? Oh, don't worry about it, just read Quran, it will be fixed, right? While we have a clear hadith that encourages us to take medicine. So again, generalizing fatwa and giving it up to people. Okay, so let's play the video, please. Mashallah, I can't believe you've been Muslim for two months and you're not married yet. There's this brother who's looking to get married. <laughs> you can't stay on your own, you need to get married. Yeah, I know, but I'm, I'm not ready yet. 
With that, I congratulate the groom from the marriage. <laughs> You're going to become a father. Alhamdulillah, great news. <laughs> Right? Imposing your own opinions without having a conversation about what, it requ what is required, what is needed to have a successful marriage, who you should marry, all that sort of important conversations. Right? So that's an example of that. Uh, before that was a parent-child conflict. Were there people available to explain to her how to deal with her parents, or how to deal with his parents, or to explain to the parents that it's not to, to address their fears, right? Was she suggested to bring the parents on or to visit the parents and try to address their fears? And then, you know, directing her to get married and not, you know, benefiting from the whole experience, the all knowledge that we have around what it takes to have a successful marriage. What are the things that she should be looking for when she's considering somebody for marriage, right? And then again, it comes back to you know, giving responsibility, responsibility to the converts themselves, and this is something that we'll talk about tomorrow, but right now we're talking about the community role, right? And this is when some of the masajid or the imams and other people will come in too, were they advising or not? But sometimes it's quite late to advise as well. So, so that's something to keep in mind, right? That when we are dealing with them, not to give them generic advices. Okay, let's please continue the video. Why don't you do it? You want the angels to curse you? Why are you chatting to sisters online? Why don't you treat me like this? Just shut up. Why? Why am I ever going to... Shut your mouth and don't question me. <laughs> oh, mashallah. Congratulations to you guys. No! How dare you question me? You're divorced. Mom, I need your help. I've got nowhere to go. So you're... And this is very, very common with Muslims and renewed Muslims and converts, all of them. So something very important. So when do you think all these things were happening in her marriage? The divorce or the abuse would not just happen overnight. It happened over time, right? So definitely the sister would have spoken to some of the other sisters in the masjid, right? So that's not an interesting thing. What kind of advice would she be given or be patient with him, right? And this is something that's very common. Like sometimes we um, do strategic intervention or coaching in relationship cases. And a lot of time we get that when things are quite worse. There has been a lot of damage that has already been done. So people wait a long time. And part of that is they're not given appropriate advice that help is available. You can seek professional counseling, professional coaching, professional intervention to kind of address those issues as they are building up. Another angle of that, and that is nothing specific to converse, is domestic abuse, right? If it's not something that's intercepted and taken care of, if you see this anger, man anger management issue and a problem, a lot of time our own brothers that we know from the community you can find them hanging out in detention centers and jail with serial criminals because of domestic violence. And it's not easy once the law enforcement is involved, it's not easy. There's a whole diff big process, the bail process, uh, the court processes, the criminal record. I know people who are very talented, very skillful, but could not get job because of criminal record that is related to domestic violence. So that's another thing, when, when we are seeing problems happening, like how we would do in our physical bodies, we see we have a cough, we are, we are having continuous pain, we go, we get, we get it checked out, and we, we intercept it, we take the right medicine. We should, do, we should do the same thing whenever relationships are falling apart. And advise the same thing to converse and reverse as well. Okay, let's continue. Still following this nonsense. You've been beaten black and blue, divorced, and you still believe in your Allah. Allahu Akbar. You need to leave. Please, can I 
space for yours or just please just lend me some money I'll pay you back inshallah sorry sister we need the space for Dawood but he's four now inshallah you'll find something maybe ask the masjid That's another thing, right? How do we deal with, you know, when things are really broke, breaking apart, right? So now this stage, obviously, if somebody reaches that state, you know, out of home, you know, what kind of solutions do we have available in the community for financial assistance, for accommodation assistance? And we do, alhamdulillah, especially in Toronto, we have a lot of different services that are available. Uh, it's just that, do you have a team that will make those type of connection for converts and renewed Muslims and so on and so forth? Right? And that is also important, right? So now let me go back a bit about the teams, right? Some people are like, oh, I will just work individually, right? So that's another extreme. So what happens is that you cannot scale that, right? So you can help somebody, and I know there are some converts, and I'm, I don't want to generalize, but we also want to see all sides of the story, right? They are being continuously helped financially, they still ask, and they still blame the Muslim community. The reason also being that we sometimes try to shy away from using a structured approach as somebody who is working on their situation. Okay, let us facilitate you know, accommodation and food, but let us also have a plan on how you would become financially self-sufficient, right? So sometimes this sort of thing also kicks in, but if you use a dedicated team, somebody who is experienced, they can deal with those type of situations. And you know, provide accommodations and, you know, food and so on and so forth. So that's something you can also influence, right? Keep an eye on what exists in the society. As you make your donations, you know, keep, do some sort of accountability on expectations and actual delivery of results, right? So ask the right questions. What is happening? How are you addressing that problem? So if you have a Dawah team around you that are handing out pamphlets and Qurans and so on and so forth, ask them. What kind of model, what kind of system, what kind of a structure is in place to take care of the new Muslims, right? So these are some of the things that you can influence. And obviously from a masajid and organization's point of view, they can focus on having you know, such a team, getting them trained from people who have experience, so they don't have to reinvent the wheel, and build on, the, on top of that. Another thing that you can do is have educational programs or ex, a, a know-off teachers who can teach the converse and the reverse and having short reminders in the masajid after some of the prayers can really help people you know elevate it spiritually and help them uh, increase and strengthen their relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala another thing is if you get into this thing how do you actually correct people what kind of manners would you use to correct people so obviously the first thing is prioritization right not everything is of equal importance we know this from the hadith of the Mu'ad radiallahu an, when the Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa advised them when sending him to Yemen, that call them to Tawheed first. If they accept, then the prayers, and so on and so forth. Right? Gentleness, compassion. How did the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa dealt with the Bedouin who came and urinated in the masjid? So you start with compassion, understanding, gentleness, and then you elevate them. Reasoning, right? The Prophet of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam using logic and reason to, to deal with the brother, the companion, who asked him to allow him to, be, uh, to permit, to allow him and give him the permission to commit zina. And how he related to that boy, and how he made dua for him, and how he explained the negative effects of this act. So some of the things that you can do as a community also from a social angle, and we, did this, we do this at Abu Huraira, alhamdulillah, is you know, having being available for ad hoc help, right? So now you understand, let's say some of the convert mentality, you know, you won't be pushing them, you won't be giving them fatwa, but you can be available, say, hey, you know what, if you need some time some, to, to drive somebody around, to drop, to drop somebody, to pick up somebody, or one, you know, one time help, let me know. So sometimes we have a group of people, and if we need help, you know, one-off one, uh, one help, we can put that in the group, request them, and then somebody can, you know, step up and say, hey, you know, we have somebody who's sick, let's visit him, let's take him to doctor, what have you. So this type of small X, you know, go a long way. The same thing with uh, social events, right? So a lot of people, alhamdulillah, they let us know when they're having walima or aqiqa or barbecues or eat parties. So we can send some converse to those, you know, to those events. And this really helps them build a good social circle. 
And that is obviously very important as well. So in summary, you know, this is a very important uh, audience that we have to pay attention to. Right? How do we support them? How do we elevate them? So, and how do we avoid some of the common mistakes when dealing with them? So I hope you'll pay attention to that and think about how you can contribute to that cause. Uh, finally, to close off, we'll play a successful story in the importance of why having such a team and focus is important. So there's a brother, he's going to be narrating his story, and he'll be telling you about, you know, how he first started and he was just given books and maybe a contact card and just like left alone. Words is how he has changed, you know, with right support and, uh, uh, and uh, compassion. So uh, if you can please play the second video of uh, Brother Muhammad Zaki. I was interested in uh, several different religions, but every time I got to a point where something made no sense at all, I said, okay, this is not the religion for me. And I got to that in Buddhism, I got that in Hinduism, I got that in Judaism, I got that in Christianity, I got everywhere. And Islam was always, there was nothing there that I said, this is, makes no sense. So then I went, I went to uh, several different masjids and asked uh, the imam or the, I guess the person there who, who talks to the people and asked them about if you can teach me to do prayer and teach me more about Islam. And they were all great at giving me books and saying, oh, here, study this. This will show you how to do prayer. But uh, I, didn't, I couldn't learn that way. I couldn't just read a paper, and, and especially in Arabic, and learn you know, the transliteration and learn how to fatih in the class and other surahs and do my prayers. So then I, I, and that was when I was like 20 years old, so I, I gave up. I just said, you know, enough of that. And, and, then I, um, uh, and then I just went on and basically, I would believe in God, but nothing, no structure in my religion. And then I, I, I met a lady and I, have, uh, I had a little boy, and I, I, she's atheist uh, Chinese. And I realized if something happens to me, if I died, my little boy is finished. He's, he's going to be an atheist. He's got nothing and no religion because uh, she believes that, uh, you know, Chinese uh, atheist that when a person dies there's no soul that's it so then I thought I don't want that for my boy so I went back to the um, I contacted somebody and there was an organization that actually helps people like one-on-one -on -one. and as soon as I found out about that and I called them up and they said come in right away and I talked to them and I, I, I right away I started learning and within uh, uh, about a month or so I was doing my prayer and uh, a month after that I started growing the beard so I uh, I recommend somebody getting a one-on-one -on -one coach instead of just trying to read off, a, you know, or going to a website. It's very important to have that one-on-one. Subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it beneficial, uh, to give us the wisdom and the energy and inspiration to take uh, efforts and means to, to take care of our converts, renewed Muslims, rewards, brothers and sisters. Uh, Subhanaka Allahumma wa bihamdik ashadu an la ilaha illa ant astaghfiruka wa atubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum.